Good morning, church. Good to see you, literally. Good to be able to talk again and see you. I'm so excited to be back. Let me ask you a question. How many, in the course of your day and all of your hustle and bustle, all your moving and shaking and grooving and working hard, how many breaks do you allow yourself in a given day? Including many breaks. 22. Okay, Eric. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> Just kidding, buddy. <laughs> Love him. There was a recent study done with our, our neighbors across the pond over yonder in the UK. That's my best British accent. That's all I got. They said, are you ready for this? That the average worker in the UK takes more than 100 breaks and mini breaks every week at, their, at, at work. Okay? They drink at least 19 cups of coffee and attend 17 useless meetings. Some of you are led up with that, because you, you've been there, right? Yes, yet another meeting that could have been solved with an email, and we didn't even have to be here. We understand it, but check this out. Here's the stat that blew me away. A whopping 56% say their biggest obstacle to productivity, <clears throat> okay? Their biggest distraction is, can you guess? Who? Say it again. The smartphone. Yes, yes, the smartphone. That is, he said management. That's awesome. That's it. So true, so true. Not at church, but yes, so true. Their biggest distraction is the smartphone. Maybe you can identify with those numbers. I find it interesting that 1 Corinthians 7.35 says that we should serve the Lord without distractions. Now, here's what's amazing. I didn't make this slide. I just Googled serve the Lord without distractions. And this is the first result that came up. Look what's in his hand. You catch that? I don't think that's a mistake. I mean, somebody somewhere made this slide, probably for a church or something, and this was the number one distraction. Now, I want you to hear me, okay? This world is filled with distractions, and while many of them have to do with technology, technology is not the enemy. Hear me say that. Technology is not the enemy. Distractions are the enemy. Technology is just a tool like a shovel or a hammer. It could be used for good, okay? So hear me say that technology is not the enemy. The distractions are the enemy when they pull us away from our purpose, when they pull us away from the reason God made us, or anything that comes between us and a wholehearted following after Christ. So as we think about this today, what distractions pop in your head of things that come between you and wholeheartedly chasing after Jesus? What is it? What is it that comes to your mind? Because today we're going to look at two ladies who had a famously well-known choice to make. Two women, great women. One of them gets a really bad rap, but they make a choice that you and I have to make every single day. It's the same choice we make. Where are we going to put our precious time and our priorities? It's a choice that if you're ready, we're going to dive into hard. So open your Bible to Luke chapter 10 or pull up your favorite Bible app on your smartphone. See, it could be used for good. If you're doing that digitally, I'm going to read from the CSB translation today. The reason I picked the CSB, the Christian Standard, it is a great conservative, literal interpretation, highly accurate, but very readable. So in case you wonder why we change up, change up our uh, translations, that's why. While you get that up, let me welcome our guests. Great to have you with us. And if you're a first-time guest, join us online. A special welcome to you. We love having you here. Come check us out in person. There's something beautiful and magical that happens in this room. All right, Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 38. Let's read it together. While they were traveling, he, this is Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary. This is how we know this is the Lazarus family, okay? This, this is put it all together. Who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to give me a hand. Now that right there, that, that shows you this lady is very close to Jesus. Because she did two presumptuous things. Don't miss that right there. She's like, she came up, Lord, don't you care? You know, like, come on. And then she gives him an order. Tell her to get over here and help me. That's something right there. Now, go on, verse 41. Then the Lord answered, Martha, 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 you are worried and upset. You caught the Brady Bunch reference. All right, you're with me. Marcia, Marcia, you are worried about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, 
and it won't be taken away from her. Don't miss that. See, we're familiar with this, so it's so easy to gloss over this. Look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted. And just like Martha, we're distracted. We're so easily distracted. Now I want to switch to the message translation. I love to, to juxtapose these. Look at verse 40 in the message translation. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Don't miss that. Check out her state of mind here. This is very revealing of what she's feeling, okay? If you're Martha, she's basically saying, pack your bags, we'll get ready to go on a guilt trip. Check out what she says next. She says, later, she stepped in, interrupting them, Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned me to the kitchen? Can you look, look at that word? Tell her to lend me a hand. Wow, abandoned. She's, oh, she's abandoned me, and I'm dying. Y'all know, this, when you look at the Greek, do you know what this literally means? She is using a term, no lie, that refers to two Greek columns that support the weight of a coliseum, like a roof. And she is literally using a term that they would immediately know, I am the columns holding this whole thing up, and she's dropped her in, and now I'm struggling like the Hulk, and I'm, Hulk, and I'm not going to make it. She's abandoned me. <laughs> and look at Jesus' rebuke. Well-timed, but so gentle. He looks and says, Martha, 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 you're fussing far too much. You're getting yourself worked up over nothing. Only one thing is essential, and Mary chose it. And you know what? It's the main course and it won't be taken from her. So we read this story, and over the years, I've looked at this and I said, man, who do you want to be? You got Mary and Martha, those are your two choices, right? That's what we do, because Martha obviously has got work to do, job to complete, chores to perform, responsibilities to carry, I get it, we've been there. But Mary obviously knows how to make time to sit at the feet of Jesus, she's worshiping, she's fell up, she's spending time with him, and maybe prayer, we don't know. And when we look at this, I think we think, well, who would we rather be? But look closer, because that's actually not the question. We want to be both. It's a false choice. Look, Mary got it. She spent time with Jesus. She gets it. She undoubtedly learned how to sit at the master's feet. But on the other hand, Martha, she's doing good stuff. She's working hard. Obviously, she knows how to serve others faithfully. She's got a very diligent spirit. That's great. So the key is finding that perfect balance, Christian, between laboring and listening. How are you doing with that? Because that's tough. As I looked at this, I find in my day, I veer more towards one or the other. Sometimes I don't have that great balance. But what if I told you, what if there was something magical where I could come like, <laughs> like Morpheus from the Matrix? What if I told you some great news? Jesus, not once, ever called you to be busy. Not once does he say, pick up your cross and put your burden on and come get stressed with me. Come get that furrowed line right here that you all love. Come walk through your day with a grimace and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Never once does Jesus call us specifically to be busy. You know what he calls us to be? Faithful. There's a difference. Now, when we're being faithful, can we be busy doing things? Absolutely. We're going to find that. But Jesus never said, I'm calling you to be busy. Grace Valentine wrote an incredible article about this. And she said this. She says, Jesus never asked you to be busy. And then she goes on to say, listen, I get it. I get you because I am you. I've been you since I was 17. Always busy, always productive, living life like a race and running from activity to activity, trying to achieve it all and not do it. How you? Because you're overwhelmed, and you're overbooked, and you're undercaffeinated, and you're underappreciated, and you're underpaid. Amen? Amen. <laughs> she gets it. Because we've been there. We've all been there. Life's moving faster and faster than you want. You can't keep up your heads just barely above the water. We've been there. However, would it make you feel any better? Would it change anything about your life to know that Jesus never showed up and says, I command you to be busy? Because that's very freeing. We put a lot of stuff on our schedule that, frankly, he didn't assign. And we need to know that. And we need to see the difference. Through all our planning and rushing around, remember, our purpose is to be found faithful. 
not necessarily to be found busy. In other words, don't let your plans distract you from your purpose. That's huge. Don't let your plans distract you from your purpose. Man, there's nothing wrong with having a schedule, keeping a good calendar. I do. Helps keep you focused. Helps make sure you don't waste time. We don't need to be time wasters. There's nothing wrong with having plans. But ultimately, my question is, are you pursuing plans or are you pursuing purpose? Because it's not always the same thing. And if you're always busy and you're always stressed out and you're always overwhelmed, dare I say, as your pastor and friend, you have probably put something on your plate that Jesus did not give you. That's on you. If I'm hurried and I'm frantic and I'm running around like a spaz, that's not from Jesus. That's from me. I did that. You ever have somebody do something really nice for you? And like they went all out and they worked all day and they did all this stuff and you come to wherever, home, wherever, and you're just like, well, that's great. And they're underwhelmed by your response. But yet you didn't ask them to do that? And it's kind of this weird dichotomy. Like, well, I did all this, Martha and Mary. You're like, well, I, I would have, you could have rested. You could have done whatever you wanted. They put that on their own plate. Does that make sense? You with me? Nod. Okay, awesome. Four people. Woo! Cool. <laughs> The scripture we look at with Mary and Martha, Mary is preparing for Jesus. Martha is preparing for Jesus, but one is preparing the house and one is preparing her heart. You see the difference there? This is so powerful. Jesus looks at Martha and says this, says, you are worried and upset about so many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, I'm only putting one on your plate. So here's something I learned just this week as I was preparing this, this meal for us today. I learned something that, frankly, I don't like. I'm not, glad, I'm not really glad that I found it because as I looked and it held up a mirror to me, I find that, truthfully, I am more often like Martha than I am like Mary. See, Martha was productive. She was missing out on her purpose. Martha was doing good stuff. She was doing stuff that was helpful, but it wasn't necessarily holy in that moment because it wasn't what Christ was calling her to do. And there it is. So many times we fill up our day and our schedule doing stuff we think is good, but we miss out on the great. You know why? Because I didn't make the time to sit at the feet of the master and say, what is your agenda for me today? See, I know my agenda. I was thinking about it in the shower. I was thinking about it in bed. I was thinking about it in the car. I've been partly present with my family in conversations because I'm partly trying to plan and schedule and do these things. When really, if I had stopped and been more like Mary and knelt at the foot of the master and said, tell me what you have. As a redeemed follower of Christ, here's the big idea for us today. Our highest priority is simply to be with Jesus. First and foremost, our highest purpose is Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, then our purpose is to love Jesus, to be with Jesus, and then to show others Jesus. So to all my busy and overwhelmed, tired friends, I have good news. Take a time out. Stop and drop. Anybody remember stop, drop, and roll? Isn't that awesome? Let's practice that. Let's all stand up and drop. No, no. <laughs> I want to show you something amazing that, that again, I, I came across this week. There's a well-known, respected CEO from Great Britain. There's a British theme going on today, apparently, named J. Arthur Rank. He was a British CEO, very well off, famous film executive. He was even on the cover of Our Time magazine. And he was said to be building a British version of Hollywood in the UK. Here's a, here's a picture of him in front of Pinewood Studios, which he helped finance and build. Now, if you don't recognize Pinewood Studios, well, first off, I question if you're really a Christian, but second, this should be the dead, the dead giveaway of why you should know <laughs> Pinewood Studios, okay? So many of the Star Wars are filmed there, and it's this incredible thing, and one day, he had had enough. He was so fed up with things in his life robbing him of his peace, robbing him of his purpose and his passion, that he said, I'm done with it. I'm going to do something about it. So he decided to do all of his worrying on one day each week. He chose Wednesday, okay? Wednesday is worry day. Wednesday worry day, right? Just rolls off the tongue. And he said he began to think when anything happened to him that began to rob him of his peace, he would take a piece of paper, he'd get out a pen, and he would write it down, whatever was causing him anxiety, whatever was making his ulcer flare up. And then... He would take a box and put it in the box, okay? 
So now we have the Wednesday worry box, all right? And he would take his stress, his anxiety, whatever was dominating his mind, and he would write down, do, 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 dear diary, <laughs> I'm worried that Nick Saban may retire in Alabama not win again. So whatever. <laughs> you put in here, I'm worried that if I grow my hair back out, it's only going to grow in little sprigs. <laughs> and we're... I'm worried that as I've gotten older, I may not be six feet tall, that actually I'm 5'11 and 3 fourths, and Elliot will tease me relentlessly about this. Just, these are hypotheticals. Just, just he would take it, he would fold up his worry, and he would put it in his worry box. And guess what he'd do? He'd put this down and not worry about it again until Wednesday. The following Wednesday, guess what happened? He shows up at work, he goes to his Wednesday worry box, he empties them all out, and he by golly, finds out almost everything he put in there either didn't come to pass or was already resolved and it handled itself naturally without him even having to worry about it. It was a miracle. <laughs> Think about this. This is so profound. It changed everything. He realized it was useless to have worried about these things in the first place. He did, Y'all, as Christians, we got something far better than a worry box. We could take our cares and our anxieties and lay them at the foot of the cross. But we don't. Very often. Only when it's a crisis. <laughs> well, I've tried everything else. Might as well try him. I've been to every other counselor. I think I'm going to talk to my pastor last. You know, don't come to me last. Y'all are killing me. Go to God first. Bring me your mess all wrapped around the axle like a fish thing just went crazy. We worry about so many things that we could have laid at the foot of the cross. We stress about them. We let them dominate our day. Y'all, we let them rob our peace. And our neighbors are looking at us as the example of Christ. Man, what example are they seeing? Are they seeing a God who knows how to allow you to rest and be at peace? Or they see one that never lets you rest. If you're going to your car, you're slamming your door, you're getting in, we're going to go to church, we're going to worship God. We're going to have fun. Where's your belt? I don't have a belt. You have a belt. <laughs> Why are you, where's your shoes? Never had shoes, Dad. <laughs> you have shoes, son. I don't, sorry, true story. <laughs> we have a chance to come to God with all our worries, all our cares, all our concerns, and we blow that chance so much. Shame on us. Some of the reasons we don't have peace is because we are not spending time with the Prince of Peace. That's not his fault. That's mine. That's yours. We're so bold in so many different directions. Like Martha uses the Greek call. It like, Lord, you're struggling to hold up your end of the universe. Let me help you. Well, we would never say that with our words. But we're saying it with our actions when we ignore them and we rush into our day into one hurried, frantic meeting after another. And we get home, and if you've been like me, you go, man, I was busy all day today, and I can't look back and point to one thing I accomplished. But I know I did something, because <laughs> it's midnight and I'm worn out. And we don't understand what happened. And Jesus is saying, will you come to me? When you get over yourself, when you get over your adulting, will you come and be like a child and sit at my feet and spend time with me? Will you read my word? Will you allow me to pour my peace into you? Because all this other stuff out here is superfluous. It doesn't matter. Would you come and kneel? Call out to me. Give him your silence and your solitude. Linger in his presence a little longer. Stop focusing on all the things and start focusing on him. How in the world are we supposed to find our purpose when we never spend time with the one who purposed us? How are we supposed to save the world when we never sit at the feet of the one who actually saved the world, because the culture will tell you you're never done. You gotta go, man, you gotta rush, you gotta hustle. People will tell you your day is about working harder, becoming smarter, but I promise all of us, if that is all we do, you can work as hard as you want, but if we don't take the time to sit at the feet of the master, you are missing out on your true purpose. And the world is not gonna tell you that. And the culture is not gonna tell you that. Now lest somebody misinterpret what I'm saying. This is not a call to laziness, <laughs> okay? 
This is not permission for us to all just, woohoo, we're going to be these guys from here on out. Okay? This is not, let's head to the local bowling alley and hoist high your O'Doul's and cheer a nice one. This is not a call for us to, by all means, go to work, study for that test, do your Peloton spin class, whatever. But before you do any of it, check in with the master. Spend time at his feet. Sit quietly alone. Find that solitude. Separate yourself from the hustle. As Christians, we are actually called to be different. And I think so many times we blend in with the culture, they don't even know the difference that we're supposed to carry. That's an indictment. That's an indictment on the way we live. We're supposed to talk with Jesus, spend time with him. Open up your Bible this week. Jesus wants you. He's not looking for your hectic life. He's not looking for your resume or your hustle. Matthew 6.33 tells us very clearly. He says, seek first his kingdom, and all these other things are going to be taken care of. They're going to be added unto you. And if we don't seek him first, you might miss on the beautiful kingdom plan he had for you that day. It wasn't that Martha was doing bad things. Man, working hard, taking care of people, hospitality. That's a great thing. But it wasn't holy because it wasn't anointed for her to do on that day. You ever met somebody who knows God's plan for your life? <laughs> and they're quite happy to tell you? I just Let me tell you how to run your church, Pastor. I, I read a book once. I'm an expert. I'm going to show you something. You know, and you're just like, okay. Or maybe in your line of work, somebody comes in and they know everything. And it's like, wow, why didn't I meet you earlier? You know, I was just seeking the Lord's wisdom. But if I had just known you were the one that had all the answers to the life, I would just be awesome. I just, we're supposed to seek him first. This isn't just a Mary and Martha thing. Don't miss this. This is a Jesus thing. Jesus had example after example of how to handle. He showed how important this was. He withdrew from busyness all the time. We missed that. He pulled away for times of prayer and reflection. He developed these practices of withdrawing and entering the secret place, finding rest, communing with his father, sharing meals with his 12, following him and having communion. And that's what restored physical, emotional, and spiritual rest. Again, look at Jesus. He is the example here. When he launched his ministry in Luke 4, guess what he did? The very first day, like literally, when he came up out of the water, and we see all three elements of the triune God on display, one of the rare times. The first thing he did, he did an about face, and he went into the wilderness, and he got alone for 40 days. You know what wilderness is defined as, the desert? A remote, solitary place, absent from inhabitants. That is beautiful. Notice that before Jesus did anything, before he began his ministry, he spent 40 days in solitude in a quiet, lonely place. Now, most of us stop there. But if you read the next verse, verse 14, guess what it says happened to him? After he was able to withstand temptations and rebuke the devil, he returns to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's your secret. Here's your hidden gem that we miss because we gloss over this and we think it's just a Bible study. Going into the solitary place was not a one-time event for him. It wasn't a one and done, woo, got my Jesus, let's go. It was over and over and all four Gospels repeatedly, continually emphasized Jesus' regular, intentional habit of entering the solitude and the silence to commune with the Father. So I got to ask, how are you doing with that? How are we doing, disciple? Following Christ, that Luke 5, 16 tells us very clearly. He says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Oh, not seldom. Not when things went bad. Not when the Pharisees hounded him. It says he often withdrew. Y'all, this is huge. Don't miss what this tells us. Jesus' relationship with his heavenly father took precedence over everything. Even serving the disciples. Even serving other people and working with other people, let that sink in. Because he checked in, because he had God the Father at the center of his life, he was able to put everything else into proper perspective and maintain the priority of his relationship with the Heavenly Father. Wow. How are you doing with that? Because that's the standard. That's the goal. As followers of Jesus, we too have to regularly enter the place of solitude and silence and meet with him to strengthen us for this race, to keep us going. Now, before you go, well, pastor, that's Jesus. He's perfect. 
I mean, surely he knows to do that. What if I told you mere mortals did this? The disciples, that awesome rabble-rousing band of flawed misfits that changed the world. There's an example in Mark 3. Jesus huddles the 12 together and says, come here, I'm going to send you out in power. And I want you to baptize people. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cast out demons. And I want you to preach the gospel. And then I want you to come back and report back to me what happened. So for three chapters, they go and do this. Then in Mark 6, they come back and they huddle together. Y'all, they're so stinking excited, they can barely get a word in. It writes like this. The apostles gathered around Jesus. They reported all they had done. They did a Then because so many people were excited, they were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. And Jesus stepped in and said, time out. Time out. Come away with me. Come away with me to a solitary place and find rest for yourself. Here's the actual verse. And Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Next Sunday, we're going to dive hard into this. You're going to love it. It's going to be probably the most powerful preaching I've done in five years. Don't miss this. How many people want to do that? Get away with him and rest. Y'all, this is so powerful, so simple, but yet we miss it. Jesus walks out on that bridge <laughs> Ready to meet with us every day, and we stand them up. We're no shows. I just picture poor little Jesus. Just said, okay, good luck on your own again. Again, we would never, ever say that with our words, but our actions give us away. You know what's ironic is if we say, very frankly, why we don't come away with him and meet with him more is because we don't have time, we're too busy. That's the whole point. Yes, you're too busy. That's why Jesus stepped into his disciples and said, time out. Put down your work. Come here. Sit down. This is even harder for us in this digitally connected age. Man, I get it. You're accessible 24-7. You know it. You used to have to go to your office to get work done. And then when you clocked out, you were done. Now it follows you home. It's waiting for you when you wake up. You've got 13 people waiting for you. That's how it is. I get it. So it's even more important that we pull away. Y'all want to know what the scariest verse is in all of scripture? It's this verse right here. Be still and know that I am God. Because we don't like silence. We don't like to get alone and be, if I were to sit here and be quiet for five minutes, y'all would freak out. In fact, let's just do that. Next 20 minutes, I'm just going to stare at you. Awkward. What's the first thing we do when we walk into the house and it's too quiet? Turn it on, baby. I just, I walked through this. My family was gone for five days. Had this great thing down in Atlanta. They, they, they won first place in this act. It was awesome. Oh, it's great. But I couldn't stand to go home and hear nothing. So what I do, I turned on the TV to the only channel that actually reports the news. I'm not saying nothing. I'm just, I'm just saying, okay? You want to watch the Communist News Network? That's your problem. But I turned this on, and I started consuming. And this, this, this get, uh, I'm, I'm confessing here. I started consuming things that became white noise. You know what white noise is? We can't stand silence. So what we do is we fill it up with something, some distraction, every one of us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. this. This is so amazing. He said, we're so afraid of silence, we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order not to have to spend a moment alone with ourselves in order to not have to look ourselves in the mirror. Y'all want to know what's creepy about that? He made that statement almost 100 years ago. How much more accurate do you think that is today when he was making that before even like color tv before smartphones before the internet for all these things and he was so dead on solitude is so hard for us to maintain because we have a desire for productivity we want to constantly be doing we're always wanting to be entertained and being silent alone with god terrifies us yet he says be still and know that i am god it's the most frightening verse in scripture to us today is 
Be still and know I'm God. I can't do that. I can't be still. 40 days? I can't give you 40 seconds. There's no way. I asked you about white noise. In fact, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come up, and I want to show you an example of white noise. You all know what this is right here? Thunderstorm. Ocean. Some of you like this sound right here. This setting right here is rain. This is the white noise I use. This is my actual white noise that I use by my bedside. I brought it today. Now I'm going to have to figure out how to reset the clock. And I brought this because I wanted to show you something. You know what this does? All this does is mask other sounds. That's all it does. It's a distraction from other distractions. Oh, I'm going somewhere deep. This is a distraction from other distractions. I turn it on when I don't want to hear other things in the house. Some of you might turn the waterfall or the summer night. I made the mistake once of doing rainforest. The only problem with rainforest is five minutes into your sleep, a pterodactyl comes by and goes, caw -caw! Caw -caw! and it wakes you up. It actually becomes a distraction. So I, pictured, I went with the rain, and I wanted to show you something. I looked at this, and I started looking at scriptures, and I realized every single one of us do this same thing with constant noise, something that we are consuming. White noise is just another form of distraction, and this is the reality of where we are. Every single one of us has our fingers on that dial of some kind of distraction. You can pick your poison. There's plenty of them for you. Choose, choose your distraction. <laughs> and if it's not up there, there's others. I didn't even go about Netflix and binging. I didn't go about retail therapy, <laughs> online shopping. I didn't go about maybe food. What is your distraction? When the pressures of the world come to you and we don't lean into Jesus, we lean into something. What do you have your hand on? What is the knob, the distraction? Y'all, even our cars have this. They have this called smart control volume. Whereas the road noise gets louder, your volume on your music speeds up, so it masks the road noise, and you're driving down the road, you're having a conversation, isn't this a great, quiet ride, and you're having a good time, the music's loud, and then you go to a stoplight, shoo, and it falls, and you're still talking like this, is this loud? Because you don't even realize you've been lulled into a distraction. It ebbs and flows with you. Y'all, this is so revealing to us. It is so, we're always consuming. And just like that, that white noise, we're doing the same thing that our cars do. And when it happens, I think we begin to feel this loneliness in our life. And what do we do? We walk in and we turn the volume up on the TV. Or maybe we feel that anxiety start to come back up. Maybe for you, you turn up the retail therapy. You don't mean to, just what we do. Or maybe you sense that, that stress starting to come and you turn to food. You don't even know you're doing it. You just do it. Or maybe you have another drink. Again, it's not intentional, but by not leaning into Jesus, you've left the door open for something else. Another distraction or maybe another binge watch or maybe you fly back to work and you plow yourself back in. You fill in the blank. You just distract yourself with something when really all we need to be doing is leaning into Jesus. Because that's where the solitude is found. That's where the silence is. That's where true restoration is found. That's where we reignite our passion. Next Sunday, I'm going to dive so hard into the best way to do this. But for today, here is your assignment. Our assignment today is to identify what it is that we are distracted by. What is the distraction the enemy is using on you to lull you into a busy life that may not be making an impact to the kingdom. What is that one distraction, okay? Our assignment today is to find that one and then lay it down. You don't have to put it in the busy box or the worry box. You can lay it at the foot of the cross. What is that one distraction? And will you lay it down? Will you do that today? Let's bow together, every eye closed as we, as we come before the Father. Lord, will you help us identify our distraction today? What is it that is making us Martha when we need to be a little bit more Mary? What is it? Will you show us anything in our life that is taking us away from following after you? 
God, if there's a distraction that's stopping us from serving you more faithfully, will you reveal it today? And Lord, help us to confess it and then lay it down before you, for you are a loving and a gracious and a forgiving God. I thank you for being the God that doesn't give up on us, the God of second and third and fourth chances. We love you. You are so good to us. We don't want to be distracted. We don't want to go through with blinders on. We don't want to be just pedal down, just ramming through our days, chasing plans rather than purpose. So God, we pause. We give you control. Holy Spirit, be our guide. May we chase after you. That's our prayer in Jesus' powerful name.